Welcome to VLGA Connect. My name is Catherine Arndt and I'm the Chief of the VLGA Connect Studio. I hope you enjoy today's Connect episode brought to you by the VLGA, the national broadcaster on all things local government. Well, hello everyone. It's governance update time from VLGA Connect, brought to you by Hunt and Hunt Lawyers, with me, Chris Eddy, and him, Stephen Cooper. <laughs> That's sounding a bit too close to two Ronnies for me, Chris. Hello. No, that'd be that'd be at the end. If we it would be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, most of our listeners and viewers are old enough to understand that reference. No, well, I was saying, Chris, hopefully they're too young to know what we're talking about. <laughs> oh, that's true too. All right. Welcome. How's your week been? Uh, my week's been good. Um, I got to go out to Hume City Council and do some, um, uh, on behalf of VLJ and do some work with the councillors around diversity and they were terrific. So, oh, yeah. Excellent. Well, I've had a good week. I've had a bit of time in Whittlesea looking at some terrific local uh, operations like Big Group Hug and this magnificent new vineyard and uh, function centre development that's coming on stream very soon. It's been some exciting stuff happening, I've got to say. Oh, that's good. The mm. benefits of, um, of that role that you're occupying out there, Chris, that you get to do fun stuff like that. So let's have a talk about more fun stuff, the funnest stuff there is in local government. Oh, we've got a list, a plethora, Chris. <laughs> we do have a plethora. Uh, so some, some big news, actually, significant news in the overall scheme of things in that the uh, the pending name change for Moreland City Council to become Merribeck City Council has now been gazetted, which means it's about to become as official it ca as it can be. Well, that was quick, wasn't it, Chris? It, it didn't take quick. very long at all. No, I was surprised, actually. I thought it might take a little bit longer than that. Sometimes the wheels of government um, move a bit more quickly than other times. So, I, again, I just think, look, terrific. The, and it's worth thinking through the process, Chris, that the council consulted with the traditional owners who said, we'd like you to do this. And it's been done. And yep. Yeah. And you're right, it's been through a process. Not everyone, as we know, was was happy, but it's a done deal now. So uh, as of the 26th of September, I think it is, uh, it comes into effect and uh, we move on. I think so. But I think it also represents what will be a recurring theme of councils um, having good faith consultations with traditional owners and receiving um, advice and guidance as to, you know, what would advance... Uh, reconciliation uh, with our First Nations people. So yeah. Mm. yeah, should be more of it. Now we didn't actually talk about this, Steve, in our extremely extensive pre-recording planning <laughs> session, but uh, you know, the, the monarch has passed, Queen Elizabeth II, and we have a new king, of course. A couple of people have said to me, um, can you keep us informed about implications for local government? And, and my response has been, I don't. I think there's so much about this. I don't really particularly want to go there. Uh, can we make this a monarchy-free zone, or is there something you've picked up that we need to talk about? I've heard absolutely nothing, Chris. <laughs> In amongst yeah. all of the wall-to-wall um, -wall media coverage uh, about the event, um, not much affecting local government. But um, our listener can be assured if we hear of anything substantial, they'll be the first to know. Yes. Um, a little tip for you, Steve, if you're not all already following a Twitter account called Grieve Watch. Are you familiar with Grieve Watch? No, I'm not. Surprise okay. me, Chris. Some, someone has started an account where they're picking up all of the various tributes uh, to Queen Elizabeth II, um, many of them appropriate, m many of them just downright hilarious. You know, businesses, particularly in England, that are offering special deals in memory of uh, oh, Queen no. Elizabeth II. <laughs> It's like one I saw this morning for laser hair removal, would you believe? So if you if you want a slightly different take on the whole thing, uh, follow Grieve Watch on Twitter. Thanks, Chris. I will keep it nice. Okay. Very good. Shall we now move on to some more uh, local government news of oh. the week? 
Yes, White Horse City Council, Steve, has this week announced that they are going to introduce a waste service charge, which will be itemised on their rates notices as of next year. Not out of the ordinary. In fact, 76 councils now, I think, or 75, uh, will have a waste service charge. So the thing that caught my eye about that is once White Horse does this, there'll be three councils left that don't. I don't know who they are. Someone listening or watching might, but uh, that's interesting. I felt terribly remiss when you raised that topic, Chris, because as a white horse rate payer, I got the paperwork. I looked at the bottom line on my rate notice and went, oh, well, yep. I put that to one side and realised there was a whole other piece of paper saying that a waste charge had been introduced. And I sort of went, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Didn't even read it, put it to one side because I you know, was so struck by the normalcy of a council having a waste charge so and I how sensible it is. So I can only assume you're, you're being honest when you say you didn't read it properly because my understanding is it's not yet introduced. It's probably telling you that it will be introduced next year. Well, <laughs> it, may, it may well be because as I said, I didn't read it properly. I just saw something about a waste charge and thought, oh, isn't that interesting? So I haven't even looked at the itemised amount of my rates bill because of course you just go to the bottom line. Yeah. So in terms of transparency, this is a good thing, isn't it? Because it makes it really clear what the cost of delivering those waste services is to the council and to the ratepayer. And as the mayor said in what I thought was a very well crafted public message, you know, those properties that um, have effectively been paying for the service but might not actually have it, uh, given the nature of their property, will no longer be charged for a service they're not getting. So that's got to be a good thing. Yeah, oh, look, and that's a complex issue, Chris, because of course, um, and we've talked about this before, that not every rate payer um, should feel that they're only paying for the services they get. So in terms of that, it's not unusual that someone might, you know, you're paying for a library, it doesn't mean you have to use the library. That said, there's um, under all the local government acts we've worked under, there's been provision for special rates or charges uh, or service rates and charges, however you'd like to describe it. Um, and those provisions are there for a reason. So it makes sense to have a waste charge, which can only be applied to, you know, defray the cost of providing that service. Yes, absolutely. All right. Well done to Whitehorse for highlighting the issue. I sense you want to say something more about it. <laughs> oh, thanks, Chris. The, um, the only other point I was going to make is my understanding, Chris, is also that the waste, waste charge um, falls outside the scope of the rate cap. Um, and given where we are at um, as a community in terms of the cost of provision of waste services, it does make sense to separate out that cost. Mm. Okay. Mm. That's all I had to say. Okay, no, that's good. That was good added value. Thank you, Steve. That's why you're here. <laughs> I think, I think that's why you're here. Um, Thank you. Dance with faint praise. <laughs> Monash City Council has alerted its residents this week to printed flyers being distributed in the community using the council's logo without the council's permission. And I understand that these flyers include uh, private information or personal information about people, which is something the council would never do, of course, contravenes all those uh, privacy principles. And the matter's been referred to Victoria Police, Steve. Yes, the, and it says in the council's um, media release, the council would never publish or distribute information that identifies a resident individually or includes private information. So um, that's an interesting one, Chris. And I mean, I think in that sense, um, uh, whether it crosses a legal threshold, that the notion of protecting the council's logo and you know images and brand is um, an important one. So... Uh, we wish Monash Council success on that little project. Yes, uh, I haven't seen it, so I don't know what it's about. But I did wonder, is this something to do with the fact that we're approaching a state election? Are there some sort of political issues bubbling away here that someone's trying to drag the council's name into, perhaps? I don't know. I'm just speculating. That would be mere idle speculation, Chris, and we'll Very file right. that under watch this space so our listeners shouldn't be surprised if it pops up again. <laughs> Speaking of state election related matters, we uh, we were aware and I think we commented in passing a few months ago about the creation of the Victorians party, which includes some uh, well known northern uh, metropolitan region councillors. We have the news this week that that Victorians party has been voluntarily deregistered. So uh, 
lots of questions in my mind about why register and then deregister. Do you know anything more about that, Steve? Um, nothing at all, Chris, except like you, I had heard a lot of, uh, is it scuttlebutt, that there had been a number of northern and western metropolitan councillors who'd been touted as being potential Victorian par Victorians party candidates. So it will be interesting to see if those names pop up uh, when the nominations are announced. Yes, that will be interesting. We might we might still see those names, as you say, perhaps running as independent candidates. Perhaps there's some value in running as independent candidates in the current environment as opposed to being under a party banner. But what I was thinking uh, was uh, is back to the Herald Sun announcing the arrival of the party as a new political force <laughs> on the scene. That didn't last very long, did it? <laughs> Well, no, I just wonder in this sort of chaotic world that we live in, if it's now a political force that actually doesn't have a banner, but, um, you know, is a number of independents coalescing around a particular um, philosophy. Yeah, yeah. Who okay. would know? Yeah. Another actually, interesting Chris, one to watch, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I interrupted you then, but I just wondered if it's timely, and it's too late probably by the time this is released, uh, you, you and Catherine will have already interviewed the Minister for Local Government. Uh, that's true. Uh, as we record this uh, this coming afternoon, we're having a live panel with Melissa Horn, the State Minister for Local Government. Um, uh, I think we've got a good audience lined up and hopefully they've got their questions ready. And all being well, we'll be able to publish that live panel session for uh, broader viewing in a few days' time. But at the moment, it's members only access. One of the benefits of being part of the VLGA. Absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, listeners should uh, keep an eye out on or keep an eye for the, the VLGA socials, uh, where I'm sure those links will be published. While we're giving plugs there, Steve, uh, last week, Catherine and I chatted with Christy McBain, the Federal Minister for Local Government. And you can watch that interview now on VLGA Connect on YouTube or on the podcast uh, channel. We were really um, impressed with the, the, the fresh approach and the refreshing uh, way in which uh, Christy McBain responded to the current issues and we're looking forward to seeing what she does in the role. That was a really interesting interview Chris. I was like you really struck by um, in particular um, the willingness or the almost an entreaty from the minister for people with concerns um, in relation to the federal local government ministry to, uh, to reach out. A, a few things she told us uh, it was fresh off the back of uh, the Prime Minister announcing the re-establishment of the Australian Council of Local Governments, at which every council in Australia, all 537 of them, will be invited to participate. And she told us that that will be around about uh, National Congress time uh, next year. Uh, but also that she's bringing together all of the state local government ministers for a uh, for a chat uh, on, on issues uh, later this year. Um, I think she said November. Um, oh. I'm not sure now. Uh, we'll need to go back and watch the interview to see exactly what yeah. it is. Oh, well, Victoria might not be the biggest contributor um, at, in November, not because of any kind of political failing, but just really our electoral cycle, Chris. Yes, and caretaker period, etc. All exactly. right. Um, back to our list of news items this week. I know this one is one you've been following for quite some time. Uh, a, a matter at VCAT to do with FOI access involving a Surf Coast Shire and a Surf Coast Shire councillor, and there's been a decision handed down, Steve, which I'm sure you've read uh, with great interest. Yeah, I have, Chris, and I I doubt that we'll do it justice, except to say that there, yeah, there was a matter um, at VCAT in the last few weeks um, in the names of Wellington and Surf Coast Shire, where um, Councillor Wellington, as a private citizen, sought access um, under, the, under the FOI legislation to some um, of the council's staff satisfaction um, survey results. So that point that it was, uh, the application was made as a private citizen was interesting. Um, that VCAT uh, refused to, or ordered that the, uh, I guess, verbatim comments um, from staff not be released um, was interesting. There's a kind of a backstory, I think, and you would have had this situation as well, where you know, historically, even internally, um, the results of such surveys are not always shared, even at a very senior level because of the sensitivity. Um, however, the um, VCAT commissioner basically found that, there, you know, and we're talking about um, data that was several years old, but there was no reason 
um, to not release that. Um, and I've got to say, I'm a little bit torn, Chris, that I just think, and I think it's that real tension between the fact that we've got transparency principles, which sort of indicate that there is a right to know. I'm not convinced that um, this sort of information being in the public domain is on balance useful because there are so many dynamics associated with um, the collection and use of such data. And I'm sure you've got a view on it. Uh, I, I'm I'm very much aligned with with that. I, I think it blurs the lines even more around. I, I know technically when it's released under FOI, it's to the world at large, so it's public information, and the councillor here has applied for the information as a private citizen. I think there's a couple of streams to this. One is about that thing we've talked about, whether you can actually take your councillor hat off and be a private citizen. Let's park that to one side. Mm. But the, the legislation's pretty clear about the role of councillors being in that str strategic and policy-making sphere, and yep. the CEO has the operational sphere. This is staff-related information. Uh, it's internal operational information, in my view, um, and I just think it blurs those lines even further. What is a councillor to do to understand the extent of their role when you have these types of decisions being made, which I think complicate it even further. And the other thing I think about here, Steve, is the councillor's role as setting tone from the top mm. uh, and absolutely must have a role in influencing culture um, and, and guiding the CEO in terms of delivering on the culture that they as a leadership team want to see. How far does that go? I think that's a really vexed issue for councillors and organisations. Oh, look, it is. And a lot of it goes to the good faith with which um, the information is received and used. Chris, I think there is certainly, and there are CEOs out there who will have a far better um, understanding of this than me, because this is quite nuanced as to how a CEO um, takes the results of the satisfaction survey and briefs the council to give them an understanding of what's being managed and going into more particular detail, how that information is used, um, I guess, sensitively in um, doing the, um, you know, the performance review and, and of the CEO, you know, by the council. That's, yeah. that's a really tricky kind of a, a path to navigate without just handing the information over because, you know, sh show me a staff satisfaction survey and I'll point to a group of people who will say to you that communication from the top's no good, we're not paid enough and I'm yep. sometimes a bit unclear as to where the organisation's going. Like, there are always elements of those surveys where the organization is seemed to be not optimal according to the results because like it's just a it's an organization full of people that and doesn't there's always, mean there's always room for improvement absolutely that's the whole idea um to frame the survey in a way that points to um the critical issues the other issue and it's probably the only area where i would take um, I use the word issue twice in, in a couple of senses, where I would take issue with the VCAT decision um, strenuously is that the commissioner used the word um, petulant mm. when um, the submission was made that, that the release of the data might cause council staff to be reluctant um, to participate. And again, we know that getting a strong participant, building the trust to have a strong participation rate by staff is always... Um, a real issue in the conduct of these surveys. And I think where staff, for whatever reason, they might be fearful for their jobs, they might have loyalty to their manager and not want to, um, uh, you know, not want to impugn them. Uh, they might, in some organisations, feel that they'll be, you know, victimised if their results aren't the same as another part of the organisation. Um, I think where, where staff are reluctant to participate, I wouldn't describe it as petulant. I think it's, you know, I would always think it's in good faith. So I think it was a pity that that language was used. Yeah, I don't think it was a great characterisation either. The, the the other thing that occurs to me through all of this is, and I'm not for a minute suggesting this is the case uh, in this particular instance, but the potential for that sort of information to be used by councillors who have an issue with their CEO as a weapon in that, uh, that whole performance dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that that concerns me. I look, I agree, Chris. And I, I think that takes me to my last point on the topic. That one of the real pities with um, 
with this matter going down this path is we are now looking at resolving the issue within absolutely a legal frame, you know. So if it's legal, therefore we should. Whereas in fact, you know, the really big issue is more around communication. How do, how do CEOs communicate the information? How do counsel as the high level um, leaders in the organisation receive the information and use it wisely? Um, and I just think it's really important that we don't, we're not distracted from that, um, that area. All right, enough said on that one, although there's, a, there's a, um, a link to an issue that's playing out in South Australia at the moment, Steve, as I, I believe you're aware. There's a, a, a person who's nominated for election to Charles Sturt Council this past week. As you know, uh, elections are coming up, and this person is someone who has um, in the past made numerous complaints and uh, sought to access information under FOI, which uh, the council has spent apparently about $160,000 on uh, investigations and processes. Uh, is the story to... that is the story, Chris, and would you describe, uh, I'm just thinking, Mr. Mr. Carlo Moschino, as a, an enthusiastic user of the FOI um, legislation in South Australia? Uh, yes, uh, you might describe them as that. The council would describe them as an unreasonable customer because they used their unreasonable customer complaint <laughs> well, procedure to ban him for quite a considerable period of time. I think it was a year or two years that he yeah, was able to make further complaints. And Wayne Lyons, the ombudsman in, in South Australia, was none too complimentary either, Chris. No, no, he was not. I did see that last year. He criticised Mr Moschino for his abuse of the freedom of information system. The council spent more than $160,000 and 2,200 staff hours collating more than 7,000 pages of documents to answer his 31 requests. And, and my understanding, Chris, is that Mr Moschino's um, uh, grievance with the council, I guess, stemmed from, or to the best of our knowledge, stemmed from um, a land use issue where uh, Mr Moschino sought um, planning enforcement action in regard to use of particular property and the council having conducted the, an investigation found that it was unable to pursue the matter further and um, it's escalated from there. Sure has. So we'll watch that very uh, with great interest is what I'm trying to say. It'll be uh, interesting to see if he gets elected to that council because that will create a very interesting dynamic. Well, some recurring themes there though, Chris. You won't be the first person to stand for council because they've had a grievance with how the council has functioned. So, um, yeah, as you say, we'll watch this space. Yeah. Uh, now, we talked about Moreland soon to be Marybeck before. The, the issue of alleged electoral fraud, which has been playing out uh, since the last election, uh, basically, has had a development this week, I believe. It has indeed. Well, the matter's now at court, so we'll have to be um, a little bit careful as to Very how careful. Yeah. describe this. But The Age has reported... Um, that uh, ex-councillor Malad El Halabi, uh, Diana El Halabi, his wife and their daughter Tanya El Halabi, have been charged with offences including ballot paper fraud, forgery, and interfering with postal ballot materials. Chris, yes, and uh, there's some talk now about examining forensic evidence, which apparently is going to be brought into uh, these proceedings. Um, I think it's going to be around for quite a while because I, I do believe I read that the matter is now deferred to next March. I think. Uh, well, the age on the 15th, which is Thursday, reported the headline that DNA allegedly links former Moreland Council to electoral fraud court hears. Yes, the magistrate approved an application to cross-examine the forensic experts and ordered the matter returned to court in March. You beat me to it, Chris. I was scrolling down to the it's right couple down of the paragraphs and you got there. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, we'll, again, another one to keep a watching brief on because the whole, the integrity of the whole system sort of... Uh, being called into question in that particular instance. This is, and, and this is probably um, the bigger issue for us, Chris, it, it goes to the heart of democracy that, um, that we have a fair and untainted electoral system. And um, uh, without commenting on the particular matter, um, any um, attempts to undermine that, no matter how much they might seem to be just a bit of fun and game playing, should be treated really seriously. Yeah. So there. Yep, well, couldn't agree more. Okay, a couple of interstate news items of interest just to run by you quickly, Steve. Uh, fascinated by what's happening at Cootamundra Gundagai in New South Wales, where that council has been, um, it's been announced by the local government minister that they will be de 
amalgamated, demerged, uh, around the time of the next election, so September 2024. The council there is saying that's not quick enough and the mayor has put forward a fast track plan. It's been described in the media as a bold plan. Uh, and to the minister's credit, she said she's considering it. They're talking about, they reckon they can do it in three months, basically. Wow. Yeah, and, and they've, got, uh, they've got a plan for how the council arrangement would work with the two new interim councils uh, using current council laws, obviously based on where they've been elected from, uh, and and a combination of a countback from the previous election to fill just a very small number, I think two on one and one on the other. So it'd be interesting to see how the minister ultimately responds to that. Chris, I haven't read the plan, so I anything I say is as a interested outsider with no knowledge whatsoever. I would say, though, that my... Um, my gut sort of says oh, an orderly transition is probably in the public interest. I thought you might say something like that. Three three months does sound very, very quick. Twelve weeks uh, is not a long time uh, to put in place what will be very complex uh, uncoupling. Can we call this episode uh, the, the complex uncoupling? I think, I think complex uncoupling is good. I just wonder, Chris, what's the kind of electoral status of those councillors? What are they actually going to do? Yeah. Um, you know, in terms of their mandate during that time, um, it, it just would seem to me that um, in terms of, you know, a hasty uh, transition, there's a, um, a lot more potential downside than upside. So what the minister said, to be fair, is that she's uh, considering the proposal as well as a range of alternative options available for the process. That, that seems pretty sensible. Measured is the word <laughs> I'd have used measured. Uh, in Tasmania, you will recall, we spoke of this story a few months back where the former mayor there, Debbie Wisby, she stood down over this where um, she'd been accused of improperly using her position and improperly using information or misusing um, to rent her Airbnb property to two acting general managers at the council over about three months at a significantly reduced rate. Um, she says, and I actually think it was a genuine attempt to uh, assist and save the council money because apparently accommodation was really hard to come by. Others did not see it that way and neither did last week um, or this week, I think, a magistrate and she was found guilty on four counts. Although, and Chris, you'll understand that what I'm about to say to you comes from a good place. Um, I don't think it matters what you think, except that the magistrate thinks the same thing um, in the sense that where did this matter land? The magistrate found Councillor Wisby guilty. But again, what was the penalty? Uh, there was no penalty, and that's, I think, the rub here. Um, so the, the, the magistrate described the whole thing as unusual and illustrating good intentions. And what he actually said, and I quote, is that she'd already faced really significant consequences and did not impose any further penalty. However, uh, she was convicted. Um, so she has this conviction now on her record. And as the case was made by the defence team, um, she's going to find it very difficult to get government board appointments, um, you know, those sorts of things that you would expect someone in public life to be doing if they still want to have a career in public life. It's going mm. to be very hard for her. Yeah. Put the conviction to one side. To me, it seems an example of this system working um, in regard to it's the, you know, it's the role of the magistrate to set the penalties. Often councils are in this situation where um, there will have been deemed to be an offence and people will say, oh, you know, you shouldn't prosecute someone. It's only minor. Well, let's, you know, if prima facie an authorised officer thinks there's been an offence, then the role is to put the matter before the court. Um, you know, and there are checks and balances in going through that and the court will decide on the seriousness. Now, in this case, the court has said, actually, it's an error of judgment that warrants a conviction, but by the same token, um, the penalty is enough. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I think um, it's a nice example of the system working. And, and probably didn't have much choice on the on the letter of the law. And, you know, someone said to me, this is this is ridiculous, doesn't pass the pub test. You know, the woman was trying to do the right thing. However, I did remind them that these integrity systems develop over time to deal with issues when people are actually trying to um, circumvent the system and do the wrong thing and, 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 and gain uh, in ways. Um, and, and yeah, it's complex, uh, but the rules are there for a reason.
Yeah, and some and there are circumstances with misuse of position where um, people are acting with good intent, um, trying to help a mate. Mm. Um, <laughs> you know, some backstory. It's been difficult for them. I just wanted to cut through. I shared the confidential information because I think those people really deserve to know. Um, so that notion of what was the intent. Certainly, it's a relevant factor, but it's not the only one, Chris. No. And I, I think it's, it would have been pretty difficult for the court to find not guilty and integrity would have been the poorer because then what is the standard? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, time to wrap up, although we do have a couple of classified announcements to make. Uh, we hinted next last week that we thought Cam Paspishire might be getting close to appointing a CEO, and that is what occurred on, uh, well, on Friday, but announced on Monday, Steve. Yeah, and congratulations to Mornington Peninsula Shire Director Pauline Gordon, who's the successful candidate and now has the good fortune of um, of moving up to uh, the beautiful Shire of Camp Aspie on the Murray yeah, and, the, and the Camp Aspie. Ter terrific appointment. Um, great to see a second level stepping up and uh, cutting their teeth in a CEO role in a place like Camp Aspie. Um, I, think, I, I think that's terrific. And a female appointment as well, which is great for the, uh, for the numbers. We're nowhere near parity, but uh, it all helps. And um, another big tick for the LG Pro emerging and uh, um, uh, XLP leadership type programs because uh, Pauline's come through one of those. No, I believe, another so. graduate, yeah. yeah. No, lots to like about that, Chris. So, yeah, well done to all. Good stuff. And uh, the Bulloke by-election uh, candidates have been determined. There are six candidates. I'm not going to read them all. That uh, by-election is happening uh, I think election day is the 15th of October. So we wish everyone well with that process over the next few weeks. Chris, I, I became alert to that by, um, and I'd recommend if anyone's not that they ought following the VAC uh, Twitter account and the, uh, the candidates list with their candidate statement popped up on my Twitter feed and I had a read and five of the six candidates have submitted a statement. Yeah. And I'd have to say, what a quality list. So uh, lucky people in Bullock because I would have found it really hard um, uh, to, to sort of choose who I'd vote for. They're, um, they're a terrific group of candidates. I was really pleased to see there were six candidates as well, Steve, because um, if you just look across the border in South Australia, there's a growing list of councils there that have failed to attract sufficient nominations for positions on councils. Even some mayors, like there's two councils that will need to have supplementary elections after this round of elections at considerable cost um, because nobody put their hand up for the mayoral position. Uh, that's a pretty sad state of affairs, I reckon. Yeah, and it really, we're, <laughs> we're landing on a recurring theme, Chris, the importance of culture. And we often talk about, you know, um, setting the tone so that the council is an employer of choice, um, but also uh, setting a tone that sends a signal to the community as to why they should bother standing um, yeah, yeah. becomes important as well. And that's not because of shenanigans. <laughs> No, uh, um, no, absolutely. And I'll give you I'll give you one example. Tumby Bay, uh, there are four councillor vacancies that will remain unfilled because they've received no nominations. Um, uh, so they're going to have to operate for a period of time, I think, with just three incoming members. Wow. And, and that, interesting, that would... Um that requires a very careful review of the Local Government Act in terms of quorums and so on, Chris. Well, yes, yeah, it creates a whole range of questions, doesn't it? Anyway, mm. um, uh, that's all I had on my list this week, Steve. Is there anything you'd like to share with us before we let these poor people go and do something more? No, they should go. I, okay, I think. off you go. Done enough. Bye. We'll see you next week. Thanks to Hunt and Hunt Lawyers for sponsoring the program. Uh, I've been Chris Eddy. You've been who? <laughs> I've been Stephen Cooper and Stephen it's Cooper. Goodbye, <laughs> goodbye from me and goodbye from him. <laughs> Cheerio.